Tell him, McCluskey. Tell him what time it is. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. All you people are so scared of me. Come quietly or there will be trouble. Man, that's just me. I'm Batman. This is Sparta! There is a tiger in the bathroom. I'm an excellent driver. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Pop quiz, hot shot. Keep the change, you filthy animal. J7. You have sunk my better ship. Excellent! Yeah! Hello and welcome to this week's Monday Movie Show. We're live on a Monday night. We are slightly late, but come on, we're on a Monday night. Yay! And I sound really different and distant, probably, I don't know exactly, but because of the fact that I'm not where I normally am. No, he's been held up in a, a crate somewhere in Scotland. So if somebody knows any clues where he might be, let him out. He's been there for it's years. A, it's a bit harsh calling it a crate. It's a flat. It's my flat, which I'm in the progress of moving to. But it means that I wasn't able to get to my normal location and my normal PC. So I'm currently using... this. this picture this. A corner of a room with a plug socket there. Plugged into it is an iPad. And plugged into that is a pair of headphones which have a microphone on them. So that's what I'm talking to you through. So that's why I sound a bit weird and maybe, I don't know, distant or something. But yeah. it, we're making do. Yeah, and I'm the one who's um, who's actually hosting the show. Who's not just hosting the show as in the normal hosting way that we normally do the show. But also I've got all the technological side. So we know what happened the last time I did that. Um, not including the show that I did on my own a few weeks ago. The last time I did this with me and Andrew together is probably about two years now, something like that. Because yeah. we've been doing the show for four years nearly. So about <laughs> a year and a half ago, I would see it when we switched format. So I'm hoping my connection holds out over the last few weeks. It's been problematic to say the least. But <laughs> fingers crossed. On this week's show, though, it's a very sort of like... Monday, I wouldn't say mundane, but much more calmer show, considering over the last few weeks we've had a very hectic show. So the the gods of movies have been quite kind to us. So in the cinema section, we're only looking at two films. Yeah. We, are... we have the the true story. It's a, it's a week of true story films, because we have Child 44, the, the whole thing of a true story of the Soviet Union, of a, a sort of a, a murder investigation that didn't but did happen. And we have uh, another one which is kind of a, based on true things and then taken to sort of, in a weird way, fiction in the town that dreaded sundown. Yeah, which is a sort of remake slash sequel. It's, the director has called it a meta-sequel to the 1954 original film. So it's mm. a meta-sequel, whatever the hell that thing is. <laughs> and on Blu-ray and DVD, we're looking at four films. They are... Uh, we have the 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 last in Peter Jackson's Hooray. six 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 tri- six tip. I don't know what is the what's the sixth like quadrility sequel. I don't know the Hobbit: Battle of the Five Armies, um, and then we have the sequel to Dumb and Dumber, which is just called Dumb and Dumber Two, but not the number. If you'll see, you'll see the posters if you have a look on the site. Uh, we have uh, Tim Burton's take on a true story with big eyes. And then we have a adaptation, I believe, of a Stephen King sort of st- short story in A Good Marriage. Yep. Is it Stephen King? Yeah, it is Stephen it is, King. Yeah. He's actually wrote the screenplay to the film as well. Mm. Sorry, just got slightly distracted there. I'm just getting an invite for a conversation with director Eduardo, Eduardo Sanchez. So, slight, slight bit of off kilt there. Just okay. caught me off the can, top guard. I can, I can forgive you that then, yeah. Yeah. Just It was just on Twitter, I saw that there. I don't know why I was actually looking on Twitter when I should be concentrating on what you're saying, but yeah, it's just <laughs> Eduardo Sanchez wants a conversation. My, no- my, voice is just, my voice is just white noise to your ears, is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's white noise to my ears. On top of all <laughs> the stuff that we'll bring you review-wise, we have our DVD and Blu-ray Top 10 uh, TV Movie of the Week, Movie of the Week, unlike last week, which we forgot to do. Yes. Do you want to uh, ask what Movie of the Week was last week? There wasn't one. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't one, no. but there's, uh, let me tell you this, there was more likely to be one last week than there is this week. Yeah, we'll see. 
Um, <laughs> and they're the UK box office top 10. But instead of kicking things off like we normally do with movie news, um, if you go onto the website, mondaymovieshow.co.uk, you will see that I've just posted up five trailers in one big, humongous post. That's because over the last, I would say, five days, would you see it? There has just been a deluge of humongous trailers released. Yeah, and it's been all the big films. Because we're now coming into summer and the whole summer blockbusters. Starting really with Fast and Furious 7, summer has arrived. And it looks like being a big summer, largely of sequels, occasional sort of new films. But um, those trailers have really had the internet a buzz, in particular a couple of them which have just blown people away and have just had really just the the fanboys and fangirls, you know, alight with excitement. I, I think obvi- the obvious trailer that, that's kicked this deluge of big, massive ones, because I, I'm guessing the studios realised that the first trailer that we'll have a quick chat about um, just exploded the internet, so they thought, we need a piece of this pie, so we need to release our trailers. And because... A special convention which was held in California, which was um, all based around Star Wars, the Star Con, Wars Con, Star Wars Con, whatever I, I it's called. It. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure if Mark is listening, he will um, punish us for not knowing that. <laughs> yeah, and so the first trailer that was shown was practically the proper trailer, and um, the first proper trailer where it showed us more footage of Star Wars: The Force Awakens. Mm-hmm. So yeah. What- I mean, the thing is, I, I'm i a Star Wars fan. I love the original series. I don't so much mind the new trilogy, but it's it's kind of like Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. I love Lord of the Rings. I love the original Star Wars trilogy. I like The Hobbit. I like the new Star Wars trilogy. So I'm excited for it, but i got to say, I was, I was... The first teaser trailer that was released a little while ago, understandably, it was a small thing. It was just a thing to whet people's appetites. Some people went absolutely crazy about it. I didn't. This newer one, I, similar kind of reaction, a little bit more better, I think. But I do love there is an opening shot of the film, which, you know, if you have never been sure of the definition of the word epic, you will be after the first five seconds of this trailer. There is a shot basically in Tatooine, presumably, which is just the desert. You've got. Uh, no, he's sh- actually come out with the name of it, and I can't remember what it is. It's not oh, Tatooine. It's not... Okay, well, it's it's, it's similar it's thing. Something though. begins with a letter K or something like that. Oh well, oh, that's me. That's me. Sort of wrong on that one, but but it's a it's an epic shot of you know the Star Destroyers, one of them um, just sort of lying in the sand, you know, and and it's it's a kind of thing that's like you know I want a picture of that on my wall. I want that on my wall. It's an awesome picture. Yeah, the, um, I sort of like caused uproar in the FTN ranks because following the nerd, uh, let's just say Mark is probably one of the biggest Star Wars fans I know. And then the rest of the people, uh, there is a lot of Star Wars nerds within following the nerd. And I caused major uproar by saying that the, the amount of um, arguments I was having with them on, on Facebook <laughs> and the fact that I thought the trailer was very meh. And the reason why I thought the trailer was very meh is because... It didn't. It doesn't show that much, which is understandable because it is se- the second teaser trailer, and it's it's slightly longer than the original one. But I thought what it showed was probably what I was pr- expecting a Star Wars trailer to be like, and the amount of build up that a lot of people are, have had with this trailer, especially with Mark or, or and Saxon as well, by saying this is the big best thing I've ever seen. This is epic. If they go into the movie. And it is just slightly less than what they're expecting. They will be disappointed. They have got their, their, their expectations so high that it's going to take something unbelievable to top them. And this mm-hmm. is no offence to Mark. I'm just wondering, because he is such a big, massive Star Wars fan, if he's slightly deluded, if he's not given the movie any leeway, if he's instantly made his mind up where, um, that the film is going to be epic... And yet he'll go in, even if the movie is not very good, and come out and still say it's epic. I, I, I'm hoping that's not going to be the case, but he's built the movie up so much so that I think he might end up having a bit of a fall. Well, I'm, I'm not going to touch that one with the bars, Paul, because he and I have, poss- have almost fallen out this last week over Marvel and DC chat. 
<laughs> I'm not going to risk that because it's not worth falling out over, and it's been a rough week. So um, I'm I'll, I kind of decided I'm not getting I'm not going there. All I'll just say is go onto the the website mondaymovieshow.co.uk and it's the first of the five trailers that I put up and watch it for yourself and give us your feedback at um, at Monday Movie Show on Twitter, Monday um, Facebook.com forward slash Monday Movie Show or Monday Movie Show at Yahoo.com. Just tell us what you think. I'll leave a comment underneath the post on what you think um but i say don't build up your hope so much because yeah. i've done that in the past with certain films and they haven't met my expectations and i've been sorely disappointed i don't want that to happen with any movie this year even though there is one specific film coming out at the end of the year which i cannot wait for but i don't want to do that anymore because it, it stops me from enjoying the film because i'm always going to be sitting on edge watching the movie going this better be this epic this better be this epic that i'm hoping it to be and I don't well, want that to be the case. Well, we haven't got, admittedly, as long as we have. That's that's of the five trailers. That is the one that is not the furthest away. Um, that is got a release date in the UK of 18th of December at the moment. So yeah. it's not too far off. It is only six months away. So, well, so seven months away. So it's not that far off. And I expect that probably somewhere between now and then we will get a more full detail trailer. There'll be a full trailer released um, yeah. within the coming months, in, in July, August time, probably. Um, It'll probably be attached to some other, to, to one of the other Disney-related films, as they're obviously the owner of Star Wars now. Yeah, I would, I would probably guess so. My guess is probably around about August time. Maybe he's, yep. might well, be a, a chance attached to Inside Out. That or Pixar's. that or there is uh, one of the Marvel films coming out, which we'll get to in a little while, on seventeenth of July. So. Yeah. That's a possibility there. Um, other trailers uh, on the site. I'm guessing the trailer that you're alluding to, where it is a bit too far off in the future, is Batman vs Superman: Dawn of Justice. Teaser yep, trailer this release is, for that. Yep, this is just under a year away now. We've got 25th of March, which is quite early for them to have a trailer which has as much footage in it as it does, but yet still kind of doesn't show anything. <laughs> yeah, because the film itself is nowhere near you finished. <laughs> yeah, um, I gotta say with this one, really underwhelmed. Even more so than Star Wars. I was honestly watching it and I thought it's not going to be much in it. But even my low expectations of it were not met. And this is where Mark and I had a falling out. Mark for following the nerd, which I'm not going to go into more. But it's just a case of difference in the opinions and. Um, he is he is himself even a, a confessed sort of more DC than Marvel fanboy, so won't hold it against him. But <laughs> um, it's I I just found it I found it honestly kind of a bit like a damp squid, unfortunately. I found it very much like the kind of trailer that fans would cut together. You know when you you see these um, mock up trailers, which a lot of on YouTube when people type in Batman versus Superman, they'll, they'll come up with some kind of trailer that some fan has mocked together from previous Batman and Superman movies just to make it look like an official trailer. You've getting that with movies in the past. I to me when I watched it, I thought it it felt a lot like one of those. Like they took little bits and bobs from from the last Superman movie and little bits and bobs from. The last couple of Batman films, the Christopher Nolan movies, and just yeah, popped. Well, I was just going to say, say, I was just thinking about saying that the the scene there is one shot in, it, in the trailer that shows Batman standing on top of a sign, you know, on top of a not a sign, on top of a building like a spire. I can't remember exactly what it's, but it was obviously an attempt to copy the shot from Dark Knight Rises with Batman standing on top of a similar kind of spire, and it doesn't have the gravitas that that shot, that same shot had in Christopher Nolan's film. It doesn't look as really cinematic as it does in Dark Knight Rises. So already, I have doubts. Yeah. Um, other trailers on the site. Ant Man. Yep. This is the one we've got. This is set for the seventeenth of July. The one that I was saying that potentially we may have Star Wars the final trailer released with because it's all connected. Marvel is owned by Disney. Disney now also owns Star Wars. So. Basically, therefore, Disney owns the world. But, yeah, Ant-Man is one of those ones that's been mixed reactions. It's had the problems because it had Edgar Wright originally, who has left the project under what I understand from reading things to be 
uh, dispute between him and Marvel over. He wanted it to be a standalone. Marvel wanted there to be more things put in there to tie it in with the rest of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, and so he left the project under those reasons. But from what I've seen now of that last trailer, the first two teasers we've seen, not seen much, seen little bits, and thought, well, okay, it looks decidedly low-key. Now I've seen it, I'm like, I am honestly, this new trailer, wow, I love it. I'm looking forward to it. Can't wait. I'm, I expect to probably see this on the big screen this week before seeing a certain film on uh, Wednesday night evening showing preview. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm seeing um, Avengers Age of Ultron on yeah. uh, the midnight screen in as well. But to be honest, I thought the trailer for Ant-Man was terrible. I I didn't like it at all. I just did not. I didn't get on with it at all. I thought that it just looked a bit of a. This is sort of like me wondering what's happening at Marvel. I I don't know if they've got all their gear together, or, or they're just curtailing it. The fact that they they're on such a high with their last lot of movies, they're expecting Avengers: Age of Ultron to smash it at the box office. It's Early predictions are saying it's easily going to go past the billion mark. Will it go past the two billion mark? We don't know. But mm. it's unbelievable that it is going to be the second film to pass the billion worldwide box office this year, rather than what people might have expected it to be the first film. So, it, but I thought Ant Man the Trill looked very dodgy as well. Um, I, I just I didn't like it. I was sold in it more than I was, as I say, on Star Wars even. Um, nothing to get the Star Wars on, but the Ant Man one just did it more for me. And I think my suspicion is as well that there's probably going to be quite a lot of effect sequences given the the subject and how Ant Man himself literally shrinks down to the size of an ant. So there's going to have to be a lot of effects done, which are probably not anywhere near finished yet. So I think the footage we've got so far has been good, maybe a little raw in some cases because they might still be finishing the effects. That's why we haven't seen anything really heavy, heavy effects-wise in the trailer footage until this one. But I'm sold. I will be there on the on the 17th of July. Yeah, and the other two trailers, um, Fantastic Four, the official trailer was released there by Fox. Yeah. Which this looks, is, this is the old... Trank, isn't it? Yeah. This is the old one, because it's not Marvel. It's, it's Fox. It's the whole thing of Marvel owning their characters except for only not owning the X-Men and not owning Fantastic Four, which is by Fox. Um, and the thing is, first trailer, teaser trailer I saw, I was kind of like, yeah, okay, what are they doing? It's not really the Fantastic Four. It's just a science fiction film with the four characters from the Fantastic Four put into it. Now I've seen it, that version of it, this new one, I actually quite like it. I like the look of the effects. I think it looks more grown up than the terrible first two fantastic four films that were done they were which were let's let's admit it laughable and yeah. horrible and the characters were weak the performances were weaker and the story and the it just awful and then um these ones i'm 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 really impressed with that last trailer i i still think it looks rough i still think there's going to be a lot of things in it which won't necessarily feel like the Fantastic Four, but I think it's probably going to be a more successful film overall, given the feel of that trailer and the look and the style of it than that we've seen so far. Yeah, it, it's got a, a decent mixture of darkness and touches of humour from like Miles Teller and Michael B. Jordan and uh, Jamie Bell as well, which is it's interesting casting what they've got there. So it looks like an interesting mixture. It, it was okay. It didn't blow me out of the water, but I thought it was okay. It was better than I was, was expecting it to be, which is a good thing because the, the last two fil um, Fantastic Four films, like you said, were terrible. Well, yeah. weren't ter the first one, it had moments of okayness, but uh, th yeah. that's not a good thing to have okayness in your film if that's the best thing you can do. Um, the final uh, the trailer. Thing as well, the thing as well, saying about that, the thing as well in it, play the Ben Grimm character, which is being played by um, a British actor. I can't think of his name Jamie now. Jamie Bell. Jamie Bell. Yes, thank you. Um, I have to say, the thing as well looks for a change, not like a guy in the suit. It actually looks like the thing. Yeah. Um, the final trailer was just released a few hours ago. It's the new international trailer for Jurassic World. Yeah, this is the one that I only just saw this afternoon, and I like it. Um, I think it shows more of 
the main character we've got there with um, Chris Pratt. I think it looks interesting. I don't know that it's going to be the best Jurassic Park film, or Jurassic World, you know, the best film in that in that universe, but I think it's probably going to make a fair bit at the box office. Yeah, it's a summer blockbuster movie, released it in smack bang roll up, round about in the middle area, and so it's going to it do is, for itself. It is released on the, yes, June I've got I've got down here 11th of June. On June 12th, 11th, 12th, you'll get a yep. preview here, so... Um, yeah, it, it it it's smack bang. Well, it's released um, a couple of weeks before the Minions film, so at least it's got the the cinema for itself for a few weeks, and then the Minions is going to obliterate it. Yes, the Minions will come along, and even kids, kids, you know, kids are going to have a tough choice: dinosaurs or Minions. See dinosaurs two weeks prior, and then Minions. <laughs> We've got, and as well, think about it as well, you've seen the trailer already. Minions has dinosaurs in it, not for very long by the looks of it, but it has yeah. dinosaurs in it. Um, and uh, like, like you said, you've got a few films that um, released this year. I've actually wrote down a list myself as well. I've yeah. got a tiny bit carried away. So have I a bit, actually. Okay, I'm going to just go run these off quickly. Okay, um, stop me if I get any of these wrong or you think you've got different dates or any I miss. Uh, so we've got 23rd of April, this Thursday, Avengers Age of Ultron. Yep. Uh, 8th of May is one I've noticed on there it's not necessarily a big thing but it's one I'm looking forward to Spooks the Greater Good um, not a now, fan of the be... TV series yeah but I and I didn't think you would be because you're not into sort of that spy kind of thing but I've got to say I like the look of this and I was a fan of the series right up to the end and I honestly when I saw a trailer for this I was like oh yeah I want to see that I've got, I kind of got squee excited um, 14th of May Mad Max Fury Road I got down to 15th but again day beforehand it's yep. fine uh, 15th I've got actually mate Pitch Perfect 2 you may hear a little yelp from my other half in the other room when she um, hears that because she's really looking forward to that I know uh, 22nd of May we have two releases one of which I know you'll be looking forward to uh, we have Tomorrowland A World Beyond which is the which George I, I like the look of yeah it does look very and impressive I, I, I love what Brad Bird does I, I think he's a fantastic writer and director so well, you've heard me say, and I'll say it again, I think he's an amazing visual director. He does yeah. great scenes. I, I keep referring back to it, but Mission Impossible 4, there's literally a sequence which is maybe 10 minutes long and there's no dialogue in it. It's just things happening, and it's told just by watching and seeing what happens. And that's what he does. He's great at doing that. So, and character as well. You look at the Iron Giant. The Iron Giant is a beautiful um, animated film. Which, yeah. which very few people actually latched upon. I highly recommend people seeing that film. And it, it's full of character. Yep. Um, and the other film that, that same day, 22nd of May, that I'm pretty sure you'll be seeing and reviewing out of the two of us, Poltergeist. Yeah, the, I just want to add another film released on the 22nd of May, which I've already seen. It's um, a small little horror film called Spring, which I recommend people watch if, um, if they can find a, a cinema close by which has shown it. Mm, not even heard of that one. Yeah, well, horror um, me. Okay, a week later after that, 29th of May. I'm not so hyped about it, but it, is, it does look big. Uh, San Andreas. This is the yeah. one with Wayne Johnson as a... I don't know exactly, I think he's like a helicopter rescue pilot or something. And yeah, it's not based big, on the uh, video game Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. <laughs> no, I don't Which, think it when it was first announced, a lot of people thought it was... <laughs> Um, we have 5th of June, Ins Insidious Chapter 3. Yes, which I adore that trailer. Again, this is another one of these films where I'm trying not to build up my hype with it, but it it's directed by Lee Winnell, who's wrote along um, with James Wan on every single one of James Wan's films, apart from Furious 7, Fast and Furious 7, um, and this is his directorial debut. I love the look of it. Uh, we've already mentioned um, 11th, 12th of June, Jurassic World, and 26th of June, Minions, Rock which on. you just know Minions is going to be amazing. Yes, from that Minions trailer, is awesome. From that trailer, you already know. You know, you're there. I'm sold. That's it. Um, we have then 3rd of July, Terminator Genesis. Yeah. <laughs> so you're not particularly hyped about this one. No, I'm actually more <laughs> hyped for Magic Mike Double XL than Terminator Genesis, which is released the same day. <laughs> yeah, um, to be honest. I mean, I, I'm actually quite disappointed by the look of Magic Mike because it looks like it's done. Someone has just gone and taken Magic Mike and made it the big Hollywood thing, which is what Magic Mike was kind of. Which not Channing quite... Tatum has because isn't he directing it? I'm not sure if it is Channing Tatum or not, but the the trailer for Magic Mike Double XL, 
I was really kind of put off by it just purely by the style of it because it just felt like it was Magic Mike gone Hollywood, which is literally what Magic Mike is not about. Yeah. Mm. Um, then there's uh, 10th of July. We'll see if you manage to do it for a second time in a row and make it the best film of the year with us, Ted 2. Probably is not considering the amount of movies that is out this year, but if yeah. it makes me giggle, I'll be happy considering that we didn't like A Million Ways to Die in the West. Yeah, that was a bit of a miss in here. Hit and miss, really. Um, <laughs> uh, 17th of July, we've already mentioned Ant Man, um, but also released Pan. on the same day is Pan. Yeah. Yeah. So, what are your thoughts on Pan? Because I've, I've not seen anything of it yet. Has there been a trailer released yet? Yeah, there has been a trailer for Pan released. Um, when I went to the cinema, I think it was last week, because I didn't go this week. Um, the week before, I went was to it, see a film. Was it before Cinderella, probably? Um, I can't remember what it was attached to, but Pan was on before it, and it looks okay. Hugh Jackman is in the film. He plays the lead bad guy in the movie, um, Hook. But it, it looks okay. Okay, uh, 30th of July, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Before that, a week before that, you've got uh, Inside Out on the 24th of July. Ah, yes, I had this something, yeah. Pixar film. Yeah, which does look very good, and it looks like Pixar may be back on form. Yeah. Um, 6th of August is Fantastic Four, we've mentioned. Yep. Uh, 12th of August is Pixels. Yep. Which is the Adam Sander film, which you and I are surprisingly quite, well, not excited about, but admittedly curious given that yeah, it's Adam Sandler film he's got another movie out a couple of months before that called The Cobbler which looks pretty bad to be honest and it also has another movie which I, I don't have the date down here but I believe it's something like the towards the end of October or November with Hotel Transylvania 2 yeah it's October I think yep um, Sinister 2 is on 21st of August yep was that the movie you were talking about being excited for at the end of the year? Yeah, um, Ke- no, Kieran Foy is directing this. Uh, I, again, another director, not dro- dropping director names, who I've been speaking to on Twitter. Um, fantastic director, he did a movie called Citadel, which you liked, but I liked it more than you did. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm interested to see Sinister too. I really like the first uh, Sinister. Okay, um, 18th of September, we then have Maze Runner, Scorch Trials. Yeah. Which is the the sequel one? So the the second of I think it's a three book or four book series, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and I really like Maze Runner, but we're honestly not sure what we're going to see until we see a sign of a trailer because it's definitely going to be very different film. So very different setting, not going to be a, a carbon copy thing. Twenty uh, third October, a film that I'm looking forward to, but you have absolutely zero interest in, and I pretty much know you you know which one that is. Yes, yeah, Spectre, Snow. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I'm looking forward to that because I like what they've done I, I was actually chatting with someone the other day who was say, I was saying you know you should check out you know have you seen the Bond films and I, I've never seen any of the Bond films I avoid them not interested in them at all don't like them and I was like I, honestly surprised they've never seen a Bond film ever and I was trying to convince them to start watching from the Daniel Craig's ones and they said the problem is they don't like it because they're not there's no character development in them that's when I kind of sold them on watch Skyfall. Skyfall is the first time there's been a Bond film which follows the character more than just being James Bond 007 super spy. And Spectre looks like it's continuing that by going further and delving further into the Bond character and history connected with Skyfall. So, I you, think... You, hmm? so, sorry to interject. You know, you know the only thing that, that's actually got me slightly more hopeful with, Sky, uh, with Spectre? Christoph Waltz. Christoph Waltz, yeah. It's the only thing that's got me slightly curious about the film because I like Christoph Waltz and most of the stuff that he does because he can bring a lot of nuance and character to the the evilness that he plays. He's got that tinge in his voice. You mm. look at him in Inglorious, uh, <laughs> and he can just have a stoic face, yet you think he's going to do something pretty nasty in a, in a moment. So I, I've got the hope that that's what his character's going to be like. Very deceitful, yeah. Yeah, um, and then we've got rounding out the year with the final Hunger Games, Mockingjay Part Two, on the twentieth of November. Yeah, um, which will probably be what will make or break Mockingjay Part One, really, for a lot of people. Yeah, um, and then the final one I've got written down, aside from we've already mentioned Batman versus Superman: Dawn of Justice, which is next year on the third twenty fifth of March. 
Um, we have then, of course, 18th of December, Star Wars 7, The Force Awakens. Yeah, the, the only other one I want to add to that list is Crimson Peak, which is the movie I cannot wait for. It's Guillermo del Toro back to um, back to very strange gothic kind of horror with Jessica Chastain in the film and Tom Hiddleston. And it looks... I watched the first trailer. I watched it a few times and it looks... Oh. <laughs> that, that's all I can see about that, that, that trailer. It looks... Oh. Yeah. But it's just got... mixing Tom Hiddleston with Jessica Chastain, with Guillermo del Toro, with gothicness, with horror, with sort of like a tinge of Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah. And then presumably after we've done that, the next thing I'll be getting back to will be Pacific Rim 2. Yes. Which I, I sort of, I'm slightly biased when it comes to Guillermo del Toro films. I, really? Even these bad ones, I love I'd, him. I hadn't noticed. Yeah, and I, I haven't, as, as you noticed in that list, I did not mention Studio Ghibli once because I don't know when when Marnie was there is out. So that's it. Yeah. But you just um, yeah, I've got a few little bits of news before we get out the box office top 10. Even though it's a shorter show we were expecting, we've gone half an hour. That took us half an hour analysing those trailers, which is interesting. So if people weren't interested in that, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, other news, um, quick look pieces. Uh, Ryan Gosling is in negotiations to join the cast of Blade Runner 2 alongside Harrison Ford. Okay, that all you got on that, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you had any more on that. Yeah, no. I, I mean, the thing is, I'm I'm looking forward to that. I think it'd be great in the role. It depends on what they do, but they're going to obviously have some kind of a thing with maybe more replicants or something. And the thing that was interesting with the first film, you had Rutger Hauer, who brings this weirdness and sort of stoicism to his roles and does that brilliantly with his character in of Roy Batty in the first one so I think this is a really good although repetitive perform, a repetitive choice to have him in it so I think it'll work yeah um, other news I've got uh, down is uh, Nicole Perlman and Meg LaFauve are going to write Marvel's Captain Marvel um, they've uh, Perlman wrote co-wrote anyway Guardians of the Galaxy, and Lafave is um, she co-wrote Disney's Disney slash Pixar's Inside Out. Um, I'm not so hyped about this because I mean I don't really know. I mean Guardians of the Galaxy obviously was real written, but it's a very I guess I kind of see it as being something very different from the rest of the Marvel films. So while it'd be good to have someone doing something maybe different. The question is, will that work for a single character Marvel film? Well, they've gone with females for the female character and somebody who's worked with humour with the Guardians of the Galaxy, somebody who's working with animation and adventure and stuff like that with Inside Out. So we'll, we'll see how they handle it. It's nice they're going down that route. Um, the release date for Kung Fu Panda 3 has been moved forward just slightly from March 18th, 2016 to January 29th, 2016. My guess is because probably is how Home didn't do as well at the box office than what DreamWorks was expecting it to do. That's because so Home they, is really a, a bit of an inferior product compared to Kung Fu Panda. So and, with and all the other sort of DreamWorks animations, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, with fiscal years of, mo- um, uh, of well, practically across the world being April 1st, that's when the next fiscal year starts. They're, they want to try and get as much money in, so it boosts up their coppers, because they're only releasing two a year. And the other piece of news this I've got is uh, Matthew Vaughan is the frontrunner to direct a new Flash Gordon film for 20th Century Fox. Dare I say it? Flash. No. Ah. He said it. He said it. <laughs> a box office top ten time, then. Uh, yeah, number 10, starting with Insurgent. Yeah, it's okay. It's, at best, it's okay. It's a very messy movie. It's nowhere near as good as Divergent. And other films that were trying to be like it, things like The Maze Runner, has actually usurped it. So it is better than Insurgent. Incidentally, we should say as well, because we did do this top 10 last week, in last week's yeah. show, last week on a Tuesday when the, when the, the chart had been announced. So... There's nothing new this week, but uh, number nine is Get Hard, which I know you haven't seen. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Yeah, no and chance. I don't think you want to, but I mean, it's it's not terrible. It's just, it's not any good. It's uh, There are worse films out there with Kevin Hart <coughs> right along. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's a very, a very sort of falling short film, especially for Will Ferrell, given that he's been in a lot of comedies that are really quite good and funny. And, and- this is one of them. 
and it's nowhere near as bad as uh, Hot Tub Time Machine 2, which failed miserably to get into the top 10, because um, Hot Tub Time Machine 2, I named it my worst film of the year last week, so I'm eager to Ooh. see what you think of it, and if it'll be in the top... It's definitely in my top 10 worst films of the year, and it's sitting there at number one. I see, the thing is, well, I wanted to ask you, without spoiling anything, I have not seen Hot Tub Time Machine 2. I've seen mm-hmm. the trailer for it, and I just have a feeling that there's the end of the movie is in the trailer. Is that true? Possibly. Okay. Uh, number eight is Paul Blart, Mall Cop 2. This is sort of like an antidote to comedy. It's a nonody. It's a nomedy. It, it's a comedy that has nothing in it. No laughs in it at all. No humour in it at all. It, it's completely inoffensive because it's PG. But it, it's just one of those films where it's, it's a nothing film. And in a way that can be worse than seeing that a movie's got awful. Because at least something in the movie sort of like released something in you. Whereas this movie just makes you feel like water. Like water is just plain. It's got nothing to it. And that's what Paul Black Mall Cop 2 is. It's just nothing. And number seven is Woman in Gold. Which is a uh, drama based on the true story of the... The re- remunerations, re- remunerations, I I forget the, the the right word actually, but the the whole thing of the basically Nazi um, Im- pictures, you steal, the the stealing of not uh, pictures by Nazis, I'll get that right, um, and um, the 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 attempt to reclaim that and re- get sort of the the pictures given back to the rightful owners, um, in this case played by um, uh, Dame Helen Mirren. Yes. Yes. Um, and uh, with her support of Ryan Reynolds as a, as a young lawyer who's trying to sort of make a name for himself, but find himself sort of caught up in this. And it's it is a kind of a TV movie thing. It's, it is you're honestly kind of surprised that it comes up at the start. It's, it's a BBC Films thing, and it's it's better than TV, but just it's not fantastic. I really did enjoy it. It would have actually been my movie of the week last week. Um, and I have to say that it's well done, but it's not perfect. It has its problems, it has its flaws, but if you do like a good drama and, a, and like a, a kind of a, le- a little bit of a, de- a decent courtroom drama, then you can do far worse than to see this film. And number six is John Wick. Which I actually liked more than you, which surprised me because I thought that you would like it more than me considering it's more your type of movie compared to my type of film. And I thought um, it was a good platform to see Keanu Reeves back because uh, um, 47 Ronan was not a good film at all. These high fantasy, high concept uh, movies, they just don't work um, nowadays because they rely heavily too much on special effects. And yeah. it was nice to see um, Keanu Reeves getting back to a more grimy, grittier kind of film, even though it's quite unrealistic with the amount of body count in the movie and the fact that he's doing it all because of the death of his dog but it's understandable because if you see the if you watch the first opening 15 minutes why he's doing that it's not just about the death of his dog it it becomes a much more interesting film and i liked it i yeah i mean I, i agree you like it more than i did which is unusual for this type of film but the thing i just found it very it it just became you have you have these films which have action in them and then you have films that have way too much action and the action becomes slightly boring and repetitive and that's what I found a little bit with this. So I liked it. I just I found myself a little bit getting honestly a little bit bored of the action, which is not what you want with an action film. But I will say this, the one thing I, I am impressed with is that apparently the budget for it was only about ten million dollars. Which sounds like a lot of money, but when you think about there's films out there in the top 10, especially coming up to the number one film, which are over the $200 million mark to make for action films. And $10 million is not a lot to do what this film does. The annoying thing for us, though, is how long we had to wait for the film to come out, which was a stupid amount of time. Oh, yeah. It's been ridiculous. But, I mean, that's probably because it was a small film, small release, and it's just whoever bought the rights to it will have been sort of making their money on it. And probably bought it for not a lot and they're just trying to maximize their money out of it so they're not sort of if you release a film immediately you have to get multiple copies of it you have to do all the advertising everything at the same time this way with delaying the release in certain countries you can release it somewhere make some money on it use that money to then promote it elsewhere and chain sort of knock-on effect so 
I can understand that. It's annoying, but it works. It actually gets Is the it... film out there at least instead of it going straight to video and being seen by ten people. Yeah, considering that it's really easy to import DVDs and Blu-rays these days, so people can just easily get a copy from the US. Yeah. And uh, uh, number five is a SpongeBob movie, Sponge Out of Water. Walk out after 70 minutes because you don't need to see the live-action stuff. Uh, the Antonio Banderas, where you find out that he is a pirate. He's actually the, he's the narrator at the start of the film, but you realise the story is centred around him after he steals the, um, the Krabby Patty secret recipe. It's the first 70 minutes, which is the balmy bonkers stuff about time-travelling dolphins with lasers on its heads and bondage crabs and all that kind of stuff where it is the Spongebob Squarepants TV series elongated into a cartoon, and it's nuts. And so that's the enjoyable part. The last part is a bit boring. Can I just ask, actually, I wanted to ask about this. Does Antonio Banderas in it say, you know, being a pirate, like, does he do the ar? you know, yes. that kind of thing? Does, right so at the you... start of the film. Right, so if you're there and you watch it and you have your eyes closed, can you imagine that it's Puss in Boots, the pirate Puss in Boots, going, ah, yes, and doing that? No, it, it doesn't have the, the, the Puss in Boots twinge to it. Ah, uh, the... uh, that's disappointing. Yeah, it's, it's just it's a very plain, ah, kind of thing. Like he was narrating the Pirates of the Caribbean ride or something. <laughs> uh, new entry at number four this week for the Duff. Which neither of us have seen, and I wonder no. why. Well, the thing is, this is one that my other half does want to see as well. So I suspicion when we get time, if we get time while it's still showing, I may get dragged to see it. Well, throw her to see it and you can go and see Age of Ultron for a second time. <laughs> but she wants to see that as well. And I can't blame her because I'll, I'll gladly go see that more than once probably. Well, if that's um, the case, you can see it both together once and then you can go, oh, why don't you go and see the duck? Tell us your thoughts about it and I'll go and see Age of Ultron for a third time then. Um, and number three is Home. Which I, I, a lot of critics didn't like the film. I thought it was okay for what it is. The animation is nice at times. At times it's lacking, but the rest of the time it is still nice. I still think the cat steals the show. It's not DreamWorks best, nowhere near the best, because I rewatched watched um, How to Train Your Dragon 2 yesterday and fell in love with it even more. So much so that he declared it the best animated film of 2014, ahead of Studio Ghibli films. Wow. And that shit, it beating... Despicable Me 2 as well. You still haven't watched How to Train Your Dragon 1 yet, have you? No, but I, I had to watch How to Train Your Dragon 2 in 3D as well. And oh, yeah. honestly, it's glorious it, it's, in 3D. That film is just spectacular, How to Train Your Dragon 2. Cinderella is at number 2. Boring um, carbon copy of the original Disney Cinderella cartoon. It, it's tweaked a little bit here and there, um, but it's just, I think, a lazy film. I've not seen it, so it's another one that I'll have to try and see probably when I get a chance, if I do. Um, so, number one, surprise, surprise, still making it, taking over $26 million, million at the UK box office alone, Fast and, and Furious 7. £26 it million, pounds, yeah, at the oh, UK yeah. box office well, alone. It'll be, on even f- more pounds, even, it'll be even more dollars then. On 540 sites, when if you look on the, um, the website, you'll see that Cinderella was on 580 and Home was on 546, yet Fast and Furious 7 took £5.4 million. Um, it's gone past the billion dollar mark at the worldwide box office, $1.1 billion now, um, the fastest in any film in history. The fastest after that was Titanic, 19 days it took to go past the billion mark, this took 17 days to go past the billion mark. Will it get to the two billion and will it crack into the top three? Don't know. It it, it should knock Avengers film off the third spot because that I think took some like 1.6 billion worldwide. So it should mm. easily crack that. And then its next target is Avatar and then Titanic with 2.8 billion. Don't know if it'll get that high, but it's done stupendously for itself. And I think it's still got to open in some eastern countries as well, isn't it? Yeah, we'll see how it, it, how it plays in places like China. So yeah. It'll be interesting to see what the box office... Because China has just become a huge, massive emerging market um, over the last couple of years when it comes to films, considering that a few laws were lifted. Um, and so it's much more easier for a film to be shown in China now. Um, the superhero movies do insane takings in mm. China so they, they can easily get past very very much so like the US takings of a film in China so we'll see how well this does over there 
Kingsman, for ex- as a matter of fact, has gone over the four hundred million dollar mark, and that's thanks to um, big massive box office takings in China. So Fast and Furious Seven should easily pass the one point five one point six billion if it does well in China. Mm-hmm. Right, that's it for the box office top ten. A um, couple of reviews. You can do the first one then. Okay, do you want me to do Child 44 then? Yep. Uh, it's directed by Daniel Esp- Esp- Espinoso, even. See, I can't even, I can't even pronounce a simple foreign name um, properly. Okay, yeah. Um, it is a uh, movie that's based on true events, um, taken with a dash of salt, of course. Uh, you have Tom Hardy playing uh, Leo Dem- Demidov, who is a officer in the Russian army. He is... Um, this is during the, the 1950s, after the, the World War. He finds himself in a situation where he lives in Stalingrad, but the issue is that um, Stalin has declared that the issue with the Soviet Union is that there can be no murder in paradise, is the thing that's said throughout the film. Um, this being a, a sort of a thing that, you know, anything that's um, dark and things to do with murder and such like that are the things that you find in the West, but not in the East. Um, so because of this reasoning, anytime there is anything like a murder or something like that, it's covered up. It's released as an accident or so. It's um, covered in some way, uh, including at one point um, a colleague of his, um, is uh, his son is killed. Um, is found dead on train tracks, is uh, ruled as an accidental death, um, but his uh, friend does not believe him, uh, did not believe this. He is sort of sent to, to convince them and tell them this is an accident, um, and and it's sort of left at that. Meanwhile, his wife, played by Nimi Rapace, is um, under, under suspicion of being involved with the West and being a spy for the West. He um, is sort of questioned as to whether or not she can be um, trust it or not, he does not give her up um, and results in him being demoted to a uh, position out in sort of further away in the sort of middle of nowhere where he's under the command of a general played by Gary Oldman. While he's there, he sees there's another death that's happened in a similar manner, uh, makes the connections and starts to investigate, finding out that there has been murders going on. They've always been covered up as an accident. Um, and the two of them begin to investigate this, finding out that there are indeed numerous others up to in, and including Child 44. Uh, I don't know if we have, do we have a clip for this? Yes. We do. Uh, let's just play that now and we'll see what we'll, uh, I'll go from there after that. Where are you going? Where are you going? Away. Away? Yes. Wait, listen to me, listen to me. Whatever you feel about me, whatever is going on, whatever you are thinking, we are here now. That is it. This is where we find ourselves. There is nothing that we can do about it. I would rather spend a lifetime in a shithole like this with you than spend one minute in Moscow without you. Save that to someone who doesn't know you. What are you going to do with our papers? Did you forget something? Huh? Yes, you forget this? Give me my papers. You know what happens to a woman like you without papers? Huh? She gets stopped. She gets arrested. She gets questioned. Then guess what happens? Ah. Give me my papers. So you have there the, the scene where tensions rise between the two of them, between him and his wife, um, who is kind of almost in a sort of a loveless marriage, and she wants to leave, but given the, the, the way they have been sort of sent away from away from things and sort of under suspicion, he basically has to convince her, you know, if you go, this will happen to you. If you stay, then maybe it won't. Um, this is This is the thing that there is a problem with the film. It is for uh, runs for almost two hours and twenty minutes, which is far too long. And the problem is, it's trying to do too much and trying to do too much without really trying to sort of pick up the pace a little bit. And that's the biggest thing that's a problem with the film. It has all this stuff to do with him and his wife and these and these things that, that you know the the questioning whether or not she may be a spy working for the other side and, and considered a traitor and whether or not he will support her or whether he will basically um, he will sort of call her out and stand with her or against her and 
this kind of thing in it, it really felt as if it was unnecessary. I wish they had just cut that out and focused on the whole thing of the murder and having to investigate a murder when you you live in a place where it's actually it is traitorous to shout out that someone has committed a murder. This is the thing that I think they should have focused on more. It, it makes it a really interesting thing to actually have that. That's a nice, interesting, different angle for a conventional cop thriller, you know, sort of thing, investigating a murder when you can't investigate something as a murder. It's, it's a simple setup, and you think it would be simple to point that out and make sure that's the, that is the front and center thing, but it doesn't. And so because of that, it, it honestly, for the first sort of 45 minutes of the film, I was bored beyond belief. I kept waiting for it to pick up the pace, get going, do something. You have this thing as well where the killer is revealed a certain point and you then realise who it is. It's not, even a, it's not even a mystery thing. It's one of these ones where you know who the killer is early on and you're just following, it cuts back and forth between the killer and the person who's investigating things. But when it's doing this thing of the person who's investigating things slows down because they have this happening and this happening personally and you're just going, get to the next bit, you know, hurry it up, do something interesting. And it does something and you're like... Is that it? That's all. And I found that really actually quite insulting because there's also this thing if you have in the in the movie you have as well uh, Joel Kinnaman who was last seen in the the Robocop remake and uh, in uh, Run All Night. Um, he plays a, another officer who's uh, you know out for um, Tom Hardy's character to, to you know find him and get him arrested, find him guilty, and uh, to take over his job and. It honestly feels as if it's just so unnecessary. You don't want it in it. If it was just cut out, it would help to speed things along and make it a better film. And it just it needed more, and it needed streamlining, and it needed to be a good half an hour shorter. It's just too long, too convoluted, too wrapped up in its own baggage, and I'm afraid too much of a waste. Um, from I haven't seen the film yet. Um, I don't even think I have intentions to see it because. It looked interesting, but from what I've gathered from not just yourself but other critics, it seems to be a bit of a letdown. Um, one of the things that sounds really bad in the film is Tom Hardy's accent, his Russian accent. Is it very off-putting? It's, it's not off-putting. I, I thought it was quite... It was very engrossing. And I thought it was, it was... He's definitely taken the part to heart. But the thing is, if you have one actor who does that then all the other actors have to do it. And the problem is the other actors don't. So he's doing a really good, I think, a really good accent. It's very strong. There are moments where you kind of go, hang on, wait, what was that? What did he say? And then after you've been listening to him for a while, you start to realise, you start to pick up on it and you get what he's saying when he's saying it. But the thing is that all the other actors, Joel Kinnaman doesn't do an especially strong voice. Um, you have in there Vincent Castle, who plays a superior officer as well, who does one, and... He doesn't like. He doesn't sound like he's trying to do anything different than his normal. Because he, he's, I think, I believe he is French, Vincent Castle, and he doesn't sound like he's really trying to do a, a Russian accent. He's just doing his normal French English speaking accent. Um, and Numi Rapace is doing her thing, but she doesn't try to do anything other than her accent. Cause she's got her sort of normal, um, sort of foreign accent that that you get the the slight you know ripple of the voice and such. Um, and then you have Gary Oldman as well, who doesn't really do much of one as well. So it, it's, I don't think the fault is Tom Hardy's. I think the fault is that everyone around him is, isn't doing as much as he is doing, which means that the audience finds his accent more distracting. Yeah, it just, it just feels lacking from all departments rather than just placing the blame on one specific area by the sounds of things. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's a shame. It, it is, I mean, it's not, terrible i have seen a lot worse films but the lot worse films that i've watched didn't take up as much of my time and wish me wanting that time back afterwards which is annoying um the only other film that we're reviewing this week even though there was quite a few movies released but they're only small releases um yeah. is the town that dreaded sundown now where uh, this is a remake sort of it's a, it's, a, it's a weird strange way the way they're actually um champion in this film they're saying it's a meta remake it's not a quasi remake it's not a reimagining it's a new chapter in remakes it's a meta remake and it's set around about 65 years after the original the town that dreaded sundown and as a matter of fact 
that film is in this film. Um, it's this film itself is directed by Alfonso Gomez Rion, who's worked alongside Ryan Murphy, who's a producer on this film, alongside of his production company um, on episodes of Glee and also American Horror Story. And this is his directorial debut. It's also under the Bloomhouse Productions label. So um, Jason Bloom has got his fingers in this pie as well. And it pretty much follows very similar um, standpoint of the original, The Ten That Dreaded Sundown, and very much like. The Scream movies is centered around a serial killer who was supposedly killed uh, previously and then comes back and wreaks havoc onto a town. And one of the characters in the film, um, Addison Timlin, who plays Jamie, she's the one who tries to seek out what who the serial killer is and how to stop him with the help of um, her mother, who's played by Veronica Cartwright. And you've also got a, a police officer in the film played by Gary Cole. Now, the thing not, with the not ten that Gary is, Cole. Gary Cole, yes, the Gary Cole. Okay. Yeah, um, the thing with the ten that dreaded uh, that dreaded sundown is, it was such a long time ago that the original was released. If you're a diehard horror fan, you'll know about the film, which I have seen the film, the original. It's been a long time since I have seen it, so this will jog your memory of seeing that movie. And this is an interesting way of handling a remake because it does feel like a remake. It's a remake of a film that's around about sixty years old. So in that case, it's bringing it to a whole different new audience. Unlike remaking a film that might be only 10 years old or rebooting a series that might be only 10 years old, there's still a lot of people who remember the series. Whereas with this, very few people know what the 10 that dreaded Sundown is. And because we've had movies like Scream and I Know What You Did Last Summer, and unfortunately I watched a tiny little bit of I still know, I'll always know what you did last summer last night. And oh, that movie is horrible. Um, this is nowhere near as bad as anything as <laughs> sorry, bad as like the... sorry I'm just having a flashback to, to Dreadlocks Jack Black <laughs> no that's um, I still know what you did last oh, summer sorry. <laughs> I'll always know what you did last summer as the third <laughs> in the series um, direct to DVD yeah, they, they did exact yeah. they did exactly the same with um, with there's few other films where they're, they're just done direct to DVD yeah, movies and so Urban Legend Bloody Mary, the third in that series. The, the, the thing with the turn that dreaded Sundown is, if you like your slasher films, if you like movies that sort of like have, in a way, are very tinges of American Horror Story to it, and you can see where Jason Bloom's movies are interlocked into this film, then you'll find stuff to like in this movie. It's it's very straightforward. It's, it's something that you've never seen before. It's not inventive at all, but it is feels like an old school slasher movie, which. I'm missing slightly. It's been a while since I've seen a decent old school slasher movie, and this is one of them. It, it harks back to watching things like Scream for the first time, or oh. I Although, um I Know What You Did Last Summer, or movies like that. It, it, it harkens back to them, and so it's enjoyable for what it is. Okay. That's, that's the, the second time in a row you've actually convinced me I might want to see this horror film. Yeah, it, it's, like, it's nothing can't... special, but it's nothing bad. Before we round up the cinema section, can I discuss as well another film which was released this week? So although I haven't seen it, I've heard of it and seen bits of it. Yep. Um, that's the, the movie Last Night, which is the one which um, is a, a European film, but it stars Clive Owen as a knight and uh, Morgan Freeman in it as well. Um, and I've seen the trailer of it. I just want to say I haven't seen the film, but if you've seen the trailer, by the looks of it, you can kind of guess what's gonna what it's gonna be like and it's and things have not been uh, let's just say a lot of critics are not being kind to it the thing that's interesting about it is though it's as it's becoming the trend it's been given a limited cinema release and a straight to home streaming service release so it's a film that you can go and see it at the cinema if it's showing near you or you can stream it and watch it straight away like uh, Ryan uh, Ryan uh, Gosling's movie last week um, Lost River so yeah. it's a it's a trend that we're starting to see more, but um, I would say if you're curious about that, look at the trailer and then decide. You know, if you like sword and sandals sort of things and knights and that kind of thing, then you might enjoy it. But from what I hear, probably not. Probably not. Right, uh, we'll go into an ad break, and after that, we'll be back with the home release section of the show. There was a, a real sense of you were doing something wrong, but that did give it that that feeling of excitement. 
when the reveal of the film happens, that's when it just becomes absurd. And the atmosphere and just the sense you get whenever you go into it is undeniable. It, it did absolutely zero for me, which could be for the hype. What we just discussed there is just scratching the surface on it. Hi, I'm Eric England, the director of Contracted, and you're listening to From Page to Screen, the horror show. Welcome back to this week's Monday Movie Show, which is, uh, as we said, only the first half of the show, on a Monday, surprise, surprise. Uh, you've already heard us going through this week's cinema releases, and now we're on to DVD and Blu-ray, which we go through these films. Yeah, it's a good job that um, we've just kicked there, because the fact that there was a trailer on TV which was slightly distracting me, it's for Avengers Age of Ultron. That's the first time I've seen the trailer on TV. Hmm. So that's finished. It's sort of like... <laughs> magpie with a shiny shiny thing i think yeah um, we're gonna f- be we're gonna be like that for this week aren't we until we see it because yeah, yeah it's avengers and, <laughs> yep and um four films we're looking at the hobbit the battle of the five armies the third and final part on the hobbit trilogy dumb and dumber two hopefully there will not be a third part in that um it is actually part of a trilogy as well i've just realized that yeah so yeah it's actually the technically the third film dumber and dumber yeah uh, <laughs> yeah a Good Marriage as well, which is based on a Stephen King novel, and Big Eyes, which is directed by Tim Burton. Yep, um, and as usual, we're going to start off with our look at the DVD and Blu-ray Top 10. Which, at number 10, is Charlotte's Three Mini Belly Blitz. Yeah, we, we don't really do this. This is going to be, uh, I'm guessing, is it Charlotte Church? I don't know, really, but um, it's one of these... No, I think... I think, now don't quote me on this, I think it's a a Charlotte from one of those stupid, horrendously, really bad things that ITV show or E4 show, like The Only Way is Essex or something like that anyway. Oh, dear Lord. Please, respect from that, yeah. Well, in order to kind of fix that, then I'm going to substitute it with the number 11 film, which is Black Sea. You you do that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Because Black Sea, I think this is its new end. This is its actual entry this week after being released last week. And I think it does deserve a little bit better. So people out there do it a little bit credit and, you know, buy it and help it rise up a little bit. Because it's a decent entry into the submarine genre film of which there aren't many films. And it has its moments where it's quite thrilling. It's quite tense and it's enjoyable. And it more than passes the time. And I still can't remember the name of that horror film that's set in the submarine. It's been raking my brain for the last week. I'm going to have to... Is it Surface? Cheese. No, it's not Surface. No. I, I, w- I will actually find the name of it, but there is a horror film that I've seen that's set in the submarine, which I actually pretty liked, enjoyed. Um, at number nine is Gone Girl. Which is... Uh, I mean, I'm a David Fincher fan, of course, so I like it. I really, really like it. I think it's a fantastic performance as well from Ben Affleck. I think it's an even better fantastic performance from Rosamund Pike. And I, as far as I'm aware, because I haven't read the book, but I've been told it is a very good and faithful adaptation by the writer, fair enough, who wrote the script as well. But it's a good film. Yeah, and, the, avoid, the film, and avoid any spoilers. The horror film in the submarine is called Below. Ah, yes. The David Toohey film. Yes. The, the yes. guy who and, directed uh, Pitch Black. And... and um, I can't remember who's in it. There's someone in it. <laughs> I'll have to click the IMDb <laughs> link in a moment while you yeah. see it. At number eight is Penguins of Madagascar. Yeah, which is brilliant. And my personal favourite, I know you love the whole Madagascar 3 thing because we surprisingly both agreed that Madagascar 3 was a great film when we weren't big fans of 1 and 2. Um, and the thing is here, you've got the more stupid, ridiculous characters of the Penguins going off on their own adventure. And I have to say, I loved it from start to finish. I giggled. I laughed. I, it more than surpassed the laugh, the laugh test of having six laughs throughout the film. And it's a film that I think that parents and kids will enjoy because it's, it's DreamWorks doing a comedy animation film, which is good for kids and adults it's not really aimed at adults but there's more than enough there to keep adults enjoyable you know to keep adults entertained yeah and in the film uh, below is matthew davis dexter fletcher and olivia williams ah dexter fletcher that's who i was thinking of yep but number seven is predestination which is a small indie film and it's good to see It, it it entered in i think it was number three last week um it's still hanging around although it's not hanging around with any sort of strength unfortunately by the looks of it but it's 
it's a film that if you're curious about it, if you like science fiction, then check it out because it's a intelligent science fiction film that's one that you will be rewarded for watching it. And not only that, you'll want to watch it again because there'll be things that you won't necessarily get the first time around. And it's not because it's it's too smart. It's because of the fact of that it's clever in the way it does things. It's a film that you are genuinely rewarded for by watching. At number six is a new entry for What We Do in the Shadows. Again, it's an indie film. It's a comedy. It's um, by the people who did um, uh, the Concords. What's it called again? The um, Flight of the Concords. Flight of the Concords, yeah. Which I've never seen, wasn't into. But um, I have to say, it made me laugh. It has some intelligent ideas, some good humour moments. And it's got a good mix of sort of... It's got that kind of just enough ridiculous... Oh, this is brilliant. I think we might have lost Andy. Yes, we have gone and lost Andy, which is fantastic timing for me, that isn't it? During the book, the, um, the Blu-ray and DVD top 10, we lose Andy. So why I'm going to um, try my best to get him back, because the call dropped and so I'm guessing his connection is really bad. Um, I'll go through the rest of the, the top 10. Oh, Hello. are you there? I am here, yes. Uh... I just, Brilliant. All of a sudden went, yeah, it's, it's, what would it be like live radio without problems? <laughs> yes, um, I was just about to fill in there, so at number five, we'll go on to the Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1. Okay, I don't know what you've got on, of what we do in the shadows, but what we do in the shadows is just enough ridiculous, I was saying at the end there, to work. Uh, Hunger, Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1 is a film that I've actually come to enjoy more, a lot more and more, as I see it on home video than I did at the cinema. It's very different departure from the from the other Hunger Games films, and I think it's cleverly done, but not as clever as it could be and should be. It doesn't take advantage of the subject it's given, which is the whole thing of the war and the PR war. But it's worthwhile seeing. It's just a question of whether or not it's going to be any good when Mockingjay Part 2 comes out. That's the problem. So see it, but be prepared for it not to be what you expect. Yeah, um, we'll speed through the rest of these because we are running well over yeah. time, surprisingly. And number four is The Imitation Game. Great performance from Benedict Cumberbatch. See it for that alone if you haven't seen it already. Number three is Interstellar. Do we need to say anything more about Interstellar? Mm, it doesn't have any honks kind of thing, but there's no. lots of quietness. But I would say as well, if you've got the Blu-ray version, it's worth it. You get the IMAX thing, you know, that Christopher Nolan does of the IMAX scenes change to full screen. So it's worth, if you like that, you go for that, then that's it. that is included in it. Number two is Paddington. Uh, I mean, again, Paddington, do we have anything more we can say? Uh, fantastic. If you haven't seen it, why not? And at number one is a new entry for Night at the Museum 3. Which I didn't mind. I liked it. I liked the series and I thought but it was a, a it was a good farewell, a nice end to the series. No, no, that's it with the Blue Ring DVD top ten. Yep. Um, so let's go on to uh, your review, the first film, aren't you? Yep. It's the Hobbit: The Battle of the Five Armies, the third and final part in the Hobbit trilogy, where Peter Jackson brings together loads of characters with very strange names and takes them to places where nobody can understand what the hell he's actually seeing. So Flibbity Flob has got the flimdy flam and going to watch McCalla where he's going to do something with Hooja McCalla and the attempt to try and stop the big floaty fly thing in Isn't the sky. Isn't it Bong? Yeah, it, I think Bibbly Bong might be near to the end of the film and that's a spoiler. But <laughs> yeah, it, honestly, it, it's it, it, if you don't understand any of the Hobbits, um, any part of the Hobbit trilogy or any of the Lord of the Rings, it's loads of characters with very strange names. But the film itself boils down to the fact that at the end of the last film, Smog has been released, and so he rungs a mock alongside a, a huge mass of town known as Lake Town, where they have to try and seek shelter away from Smog. While that's happening, um, Gandalf has been captured. He needs rescuing. So there's a lot of rescuing involved in the film. There's a lot of them trying to stop Smaug, but also King Thurin has sort of like succumbed to the gold at the mountain that Smaug was actually protecting. And so it's up to Bilbo to try and help him as well with also trying to stop the dragon. He's a clip. My lord, dispatch this force to Ravenhill. The dwarves are about to be overrun. Thorin must be warned. By all means, warn him. 
I've spent enough elvish blood in defense of this accursed land. No more. Sandro! I'll go. Don't be ridiculous. You'll never make it. Why not? Because they will see you coming and kill you. No, they won't. They won't see me. It's out of the question. I won't allow it. I'm not asking you to allow it, Gandalf. So, if, like me, you were a huge, massive fan of the Lord of the Rings trilogy and you were disappointed with the first two parts of the Hobbit trilogy, then this will not change your mind. I don't know what Peter Jackson has done. I don't know if he's lost his spark or lost his care and attention, but it feels like none of the care and attention that he gave to the Lord of the Rings trilogy seems to be apparent with the Hobbit. It just seems to be, yes... It's much more child friendly because the books are much more, the book itself is much more child friendly. But it is one book split into three movies, which we've mentioned copious amounts of times, that it should never have been split into three movies, two movies maximum. That there is so much padding and so much extension of stuff that we don't need to see. That boredom sets in, and that should not be the case. There's an overuse of CGI, which it loses heart completely because if you look back at the Lord of the Rings films there's a lot of practical effects and a lot of actors used to play orcs if you look at some of the expansive battle scenes in Lord of the Rings it is actors rather than them duplicating a lot of them in this one they must have only found about 30 40 extras and duplicated them it's just badly handled on that front you've got people who's joined the cast in the form of like Stephen Fry and Luke Evans but then you've got returning people in the form of Ian Holm and Christopher Lee and Hugo Weaving and Kate Blanchett and then there's a love triangle uh, love happening between Evangeline Lily's character and Aidan Turner's character there's a bit of turmoil added into there just to spice things up a little bit but it's it's just lacking any heart and that that's what I needed in the the Hobbit trilogy some heart and this is a trilogy for me, which is going alongside the the Star Wars trilogy, the last Star Wars trilogy, one, two, and three. And so it, it's it's very forgettable. If you stuck up for your, um, the previous Hobbit films, then you're obviously going to find something in this movie. But if, like me, you were a bit you were a bit sick of the series after the the last Hobbit movie, then it's never going to change your mind. It's not a good place to start. It's, I think the series just lacks anything, and so I was disappointed with the series myself. I agree, but I, I like it sort of amongst the better of the Hobbit films. But um, I do agree, it's definitely getting very repetitive. And there's the one thing I would basically say is the the Peter the. I forget his name, Peter Jackson. The Peter Jackson mm -hmm. um, filming style, especially in these, is, seems to be um, close-up shot, wide shot, sweeping camera shot, and, and just rinse and repeat again and again and again. And that's just where it becomes very repetitive, and you're just going, come on, by the end of, by the end of it, you're just going, you know, get to it. Yeah, I'm sort of, like, much more eager to have to seen um, what Guillermo del Toro would have done. Because remember, Guillermo del Toro was attached to the project and then he had mm. to leave. I would have been much better if the film was handled by a different director than Peter Jackson. Because Peter Jackson was so embroiled with the Lord of the Rings series that there was no way he was ever going to bring that heart and that attention to The Hobbit. And so if he produced the movie, which he was going to, and then left it to Guillermo del Toro, who only wanted to do two films as well... So he had the right ideas and he wanted to make it darker than the source material. That I would have been eager to see, not what Peter Jackson turned out. Turned out. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a terrible film. And it's a, it is a satisfying conclusion to the trilogy, but it didn't need to be a trilogy. No, a duo. A duo, yeah. A duo, a, 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 what do you call that, actually? A pairing? A, a sequel. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's, 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 that's what you call the second one. You don't call it a pair of films, do you? No. Um, okay, I'll go on to um, Dumb and Dumber 2, 
which is directed by the Farrelly brothers, Pete, Bobby and Peter Farrelly. It is the return of Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels to the roles uh, of the first film they had, um, Harry and Lloyd, who are maybe um, quite don't have enough IQ points between the two of them to make a one make one person. But uh, you have the two of them playing the same ages, so they've 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 you know been twelve years or something like that since they did the first film. Um, the film takes up from here, where um, you have the two of them coming together. Turns out that. Um, Harry has, uh, oh no, sorry, Lloyd or Harry, I can't remember which one's which, to be honest. Uh, one of them finds out that um, they are ill, need a, um, a kidney, and that they, it turns out also that they have a daughter. So what do they do? Of course, they set off on a uh, cross-country journey to try and find her, um, along the way meeting certain characters and getting embroiled in all sorts of things, as you can imagine, similar to the first film. Here's a clip. You guys want to play He Who Smelt It? Huh? What's that? It's complicated, so pay attention. We put the windows up. First one who smells a fart gets a point. If you say who dealt it, double points. But if you say you smelled a fart and nobody farted, like if we were just passing a slaughterhouse... False fart! You lose a point. And you can't smell your own farts either. What, are you guys kidding? No! No! I'm not gonna sit around sniffing your guys' farts like some kind of truffle pig. Forget it. <laughs> okay, fine. Lloyd and I will play one-on-one. Yeah, head-to-head. Yeah. How can you play one-on-one? If you smell a fart and you didn't do it, isn't it obvious the other guy did? I thought you said you never played before. So, as you could hear in that clip, it's really just business as usual, the same thing as there is with the first one. And that would be fine, except for the fact that it doesn't feel like business is the same as the first one. It just feels like... It doesn't even feel like Harry and Lloyd. It honestly feels like Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels doing something like you'd have on Saturday Night Live, where they play a spoof of the characters. Or the, you know, they're basically spoofing the first film. That's what it felt like, and it didn't feel like a good spoof. It felt like them doing it and going, "Oh, you know, you just expect them to to put in a line there, going, we are so old, you know." And it's it just feels like that. It's quite well. The word is pathetic. It's just awful it's terrible I, actually i'm gonna say probably not in the top 10 not, not in my top films but it's gonna be in my 10 worst of the of the year i think it's just awful yeah the, the worst thing is that, that you can see it that the humor in the first dumb and dumber film was childish but sort of like endearing in a way because the characters weren't intelligent at all and the humor matched their intelligence so it worked on that front it, it was quite slapstick it reminded you a lot of watching the marx brothers of the the 1930s and 40s which i enjoyed that kind of humor whereas with yeah. this one it seems to that the characters have aged yet they've become more moronic to be honest more dumb in a way and the 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 humor has become more toilet humor and that that's not what we liked from the farley brothers when they were doing movies like the original dumb and dumber or there's something about mary their their humor had heart to it and it had a message behind it and slight intelligence to it not all about fart gags like you heard in the clip there and boil it down to the lowest common denom- denominator where you're thinking to yourself, you're ruining my childhood. It's not like the same thing that I'm going to see as the second I step out of seeing Ghostbusters 3. Thanks, Paul Fake, you are a, mm, you've ruined my childhood in a way. This is sort of like what the Farley brothers have done. They've, the Dumber and Dumber, whatever it's called, was just a blip on the, just the scale where it didn't even register at all. And that movie's instantly forgettable. This one, because it is directed by the Farleys themselves, who did the first film in the series, it's unforgivable. In my yeah. opinion. So I, I am still yeah. here, you haven't lost me, I'm just agreeing with you in silence. Yeah, silently agreeing <laughs> with me. Yeah. <laughs> um, my final film of the night, before you get onto yours, is A Good Marriage, which I only just managed to see today, because we needed four films in a way to even things out and so I only just managed to watch it a couple of hours ago. Um, it's written by Stephen King, it's based on a Stephen King novel and it's directed directed by Pete Askin and it stars Joan Allen and Anthony Le Paglia who play um, husband and wife Darcy and Bob and they've been married for 25 years to start the film, they celebrate their marriage however there might be a slightly dark secret to do with Bob's life and the more that Darcy digs into his life the more she discovers what it is 
However, when she does find it out, instead of you thinking what's going to happen and some of the imagination that runs wild in Darcy, what's going to happen, things decide to take a weird twist in the Stephen King weird that he likes to do. Now, the film itself, it's not very good to be honest, it's very stoic and very boring. Um, John Allen and Anthony LaPaglia, even though they're very good actors and actresses, they can't seem to save it because when Stephen King decides to do his little twist of sorts, you don't believe it. You don't even believe the original concept of the movie. And if you don't believe the original concept, how the hell are you going to jump on board of a twist that happens? So the film itself is quite boring. It's There's nothing to it. It's rated 15, which I don't know why. Because I, I even think that movie's like from Stephen King, like Rose Red, is much more graphic than A Good Marriage. And so this has to go up there with one of Stephen King's worst. And I don't know why he's decided to write the screenplay for the film as well. So it, it, it's just a bit of a strange move from King. So it's a completely forgettable bad film. I was not expecting that from the way you spoke about it. I thought, I mean, I mean, the thing is, you have if you go back and look at a lot of the Stephen King adaptations, things like the TV versions of It, and um, uh, what was the other one? That, the oh, I can't think of the name of it now. The one where there was the virus and everyone, you know, Moon M O N spells Moon. There's been a lord. There's been that <laughs> poo monster one. Dreamcatchers. Oh, no, that was that was terrible. But no, the one. I mean, like the I can't think of names of it. There's these all these Stephen King things, are always, but there's always this sort of kiki kooky thing that's not quite believable to them. And so this is not any different, but it's worse. It's not sort of because it, it, the others it kind of works, but in this it doesn't. Yeah, exactly, because even if he's, even, you look at some of his stranger movies, like The Langoliers, which is a yeah. bit of a weird concept, considering that these, these razor blade monster things, um, and going down to my favourite film of all time, which is based on his short story, The Body, Stand By Me, that's got to be one of his most straightforward stuff, but when even when you look at movies like that, they've got tinges of horror into it, this just doesn't have anything, there isn't, even though it's supposedly, I'm trying my best to skate around the, the, the two the big pop points of the film um, even though it, it has the tropes that you've seen in previous Stephen King films and more of these sort of like very straightforward films it doesn't feel like a Stephen King movie at all, it feels like not even a second rate person who tries to copy King, it feels like a third rate person who maybe might be his thesis on King or maybe it's a short story that he's wrote in the style of Stephen King it doesn't feel like a King film at all Hmm. Okay, I wonder um, what uh, with those. We'll see because we've got Stephen King's one big thing. Another person is Tim Burton, who did Big Eyes. Um, now he's not a horror maker, but he's got this weird kind of horror style to him. But the thing is, Big, big Eyes isn't a horror style film. Big Eyes is a drama based on the true story of um, of Margaret Keane and uh, Walter Keane, who played by in the film by Amy Adams and Christopher Waltz, who um, were introduced to. Margaret Keane, uh, before she's married, um, I don't remember what her original name is, but she eventually ends up meeting and marrying um, Walter. Um, it's He's sort of an artist, a budding artist in show. So she, she does these drawings that have, sorry, these paintings that have um, sort of children and characters with these really strange and bizarre looking big eyes, as the title would suggest. Um, he starts doing his own things, but is kind of a bit of a failed artist until one point he's um, at a um, a gallery. There are pictures of hers, which start to then sell and become very popular, um, which he takes in and claims to be his art and his work um, and not his wife's. Um, and she sort of starts to become sort of invisible in the background. Uh, cut to sometime later, she's then um, sort of fighting him for this and, and trying to claim back what is rightfully her title of the artist of these characters that are, that are the, the big eyes. Here's a clip. Five grand. We made five thousand dollars. And it wasn't even for one of your good ones. Don't you mean one of your good ones? No, 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 no. Our, one of our good ones. But what about honesty? Oh, come on, the paintings 
Princess Keen. I'm Keen. You're Keen. From now on, we're one and the same. <laughs> So the thing with the guys, I saw this with my other half, and the thing is, I really didn't get into it. I really was disappointed with it. It just didn't feel like it went anywhere for me. And the thing is, it's it's kind of trying to be half sort of drama, half this, and then it, and then it goes in, into a sort of a courtroom drama thing. I think that was wrong to do. I think it should have done one or the other and not tried to do both. It's the thing of that it's, it needs to be, if it was a courtroom drama, that's one thing. But if it's a drama and then a courtroom film, it just doesn't know how to do the, both, how to go from one to the other. And the thing is, there's good performances in it. We have um, Amy Adams, who is great in the film. You have in there as well, the great Christoph Waltz, who we already talked about this evening who is a great actor, and he feels very underused in this film, I have to say. I was really disappointed. And I don't think it's down to him. I think it's just down to the story, the the characters, and obviously being based on a real person. And the whole thing of it, I, I think it's just, it's a very weak film. I don't think it's bad. I just really found it very underwhelming. Uh, my other half did really enjoy it, did really love it, but I just found myself... I. I just found it. I couldn't get into it. I wanted, because I, I love a courtroom drama, or I love a good drama. It just doesn't know which of them it wants to be, and it decides to sort of do one and then change over and does the other. And I would, I mean, it, I think it would have been better served being a courtroom drama and having flashbacks or something more to do with the whole thing. And it, it just would have been a more interesting way to tell the story as it is, especially given that it's Tim Burton, it's just too simple and straightforward. It's not what Tim Burton does well. He does bizarre and sane and weird. And he does things like, you see, um, Big Fish is telling a story and it's showing it as being bizarre as someone is imagining it and telling it. And this could have been done in a really amazing Tim Burton-y way had he done that. But he doesn't. He just does a it's really, I mean, it's kind of like Steven Spielberg doing um, the the Terminal. It's a very underwhelming direction from him, and I really, honestly, wanted more from him. I'm sort of in between both you and uh, your other half. Um, there, there are parts of the film which I did actually like. Amy Adams, especially, I think she's fantastic in the film. Um, Christoph Waltz. It was a bit dodgy. His character was just too smirky and smarmy and just not likeable at all. And there was not much I enjoyed about his character. Too lecherous. A lot of the 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 um, the supporting actors and actresses were very underused. Jason Schwartzman and um, Kristen Ritter. Kristen Ritter's got a very look again like her, which she looks very much like the big eyes in the film itself. In the in the paintings and so I would have liked to see her used a lot more I would have liked to see a lot more between both Amy Adams' character and Kristen Ritter because they both play friends in the film and I would have seen like a lot more engagement between those two it would have been much more interesting I completely agree with you the courtroom stuff as well it feels like it was forced onto it you know it was coming but because the fact that Tim Burton only used the last 15 minutes of the film for the courtroom stuff it was just rushed and it's a bit kooky it's very strange what happens in that courtroom. And the movie also reminded me a lot of stylistic touches of things like Edward Scissorhands. It's got, it's like Tim Burton's look past, um, looked at his previous films that he's done and thought, I'll take little bits and bobs from each of them to stitch it together with this sort of like story revolving around an artist in the 50s, but she was female. The, the artist was female and obviously couldn't sell her paintings because the fact that she was female and females were treated differently so we'll add that element to the movie but steal a lot of stuff from previous movies and I mm -hmm. sort of see where you're coming from and the fact that it does feel like a patchwork quilt of a movie where nothing seems to hit that much apart from Amy Adams and Kristen Ritter when she's on screen. Yeah I mean the thing as well it, it, you're saying about it just being the last 15 minutes the thing is it's it almost feels like there should be another 20 minutes on the end of it, it feels like there is more that we haven't been privy to, and yeah, it, it's it just feels incomplete somehow. 
Yeah, it's just the way it's actually done. One minute they're in court, the next minute she's walking out of court and saying, I'm victorious. Mm. Uh, that's not spoiling it because it's based on a true story and so people might know about the character, but is it, I'm victorious, and that happens quite instantaneously. Yeah, it just, I, you're kind of like going, wait, 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 hang on, what? And, you know, did what happened? And that's, you walk out of the end kind of slightly confused. Considering how much, how much he decides to put on her shoulders and say, this is how much I want from you, 100 paintings, it's a bit of extreme, and so you would have thought that they would have concentrated more on the, the courtroom stuff, like you said, um, considering that it's, he asked for a lot. So it was just strange to just for him to throw it in in the last 15 minutes. Yep. So, the last film of the night. Which was that? Guys. <laughs> Am I thinking, yes. oh, I'm thinking you had... Oh, sorry, yes. Nope. I'm completely we've done four. Done four. It isn't time flying when we're having fun. Yeah. Woo. So, uh... We'll see in a moment. I will remember this week to say t- uh, what will be our, our actual movies of the week. But before that, TV movies of the week. Now, I've got a suspicion we may have picked the same one on a particular date. Um, I hope it, not. It won't be my first film, which is Wednesday the 22nd at 11.10pm on Film 4. And that's Killer Joe. I thought you would pick that, so that's why I didn't yep. choose that. <laughs> I knew you'd think I did that, because I do absolutely love it. It is a very cool. dark film. It's on 11, 10 p.m. for a very good reason. Um, but it is kind of the film that kind of revived Matthew McConaughey's performance, because he does give such a great and dark and weird performance in it. But be ready for it being a little bit of a hard watch for some people. At times, um, with something fast food related, even though it actually made me hungry. <laughs> uh, oh yes, um, that's that's not the way I've anyone heard anyone describe. No, it, 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 honestly, it did really make me hungry <laughs> after it finished. I went, "Yep, I could do with some of that myself." <laughs> right. Um, the other one I've chosen is on Sunday. Oh God. <laughs> at nine o'clock. Oh God. On Channel Four. Yes. <laughs> I hit you. And that is the premiere of the fantastic, the incredible, the impossible. Yep. Which is just an amazing film. It is. Um, now, you pronounce his name, so I can't say his name. Juan Antonio Bayona. Yeah. Who did a fantastic job with a small film. And it is. I mean, we were talking about earlier in the film, John Wick made for 10 million. This was made for, I think it was about 25 million. Yes. And it's honestly, it's a shocking film that it's made on that budget. Not only that, it's a shocking and powerful film that if you do not feel something pulling at your heartstrings by the end of it, then, you know, go and make sure you still have a pulse. Because it's it's rich at 12. Yeah, and it's a harsh film, but it's a powerful film. And it's it's one of those ones that you need to see it just to believe it. It's based on the true story of the tsunami that happened in 2009? No. Four. Four. Yeah. Um, So I think it's been 10 years since that, but I mean, it's still powerful to this day to think about it, and especially when you see it in the details that you do in this. Yeah, with uh, Naomi Watts, Ewan McGregor, Tom Holland. It's just, there are scenes in this film which made me cry. Not just once. There are multiple scenes in this film which made me cry, and the direction from Juan Antonio Bayona is just outstanding. Um, I adore him as a director. He's a very understated director. He, he's done uh, episodes of Penny Dreadful. Um, he's got a, another film coming out soon, well, next year, actually. Um, he did The Orphanage as well, which I adore The Orphanage. Um, so I love him as a director. His movies are very personal. He's got a very personal touch to them, and this movie is... Equally, yeah, yeah, I did change a few things considering that the original couple was Spanish and so he made the, the couple American in this film. But it's not like understandable considering that it is an American studio who's footing up the money to make yeah. the movie. So you have to make some constraints somewhere. But what he managed to do, he managed to get the message across in such a harsh manner. And I still can't believe this movie got a, a rated a 12 year in cinema and 12 on Blu ray and DVD considering some of the, the graphic nature of some of the film but please please watch it because it is such a an amazing fantastic film yeah did you have any other film in that because that was no nope, just the impossible just the impossible yeah uh, so 
that's it for this week's show. Thank you for listening to us live if you have. Um, if you're listening to us anywhere else, iTunes um, or... Um, I forget the name of the other one. I'm terrible. Podkicker. Podkicker, yes. If you're listening to either of those, please feel free to give us some feedback. You can also give us feedback directly. You can email us at mondaymovieshow at yahoo.com. No, yahoo.co.uk. Uh, you can find us at mondaymovieshow.co.uk, the website. Um, where you have those trailers, as we were saying at the start of the show. You can also find us on Facebook, uh, for facebook.com forward slash Monday Movie Show. And you can find us on Twitter at Monday Movie, Monday Movie Show, as well as Stuart directly at, at Cryptic, Cryptic Tadpole? At Cryptic Tadpole. I hate Bowl, you sorry. for that. <laughs> oh, let's see. Who, I'm who, at Cryptic who tweets Tadpole. That. Cryptic if, if there is somebody out there who's listening to the show and your name is at Craptic Tadpole, please do get in contact with me. <laughs> so I'm just eager. Um, and you can reach me at AHDVD. So, um, uh, before you film... do that, there is somebody I want to give a shout out to um, on Twitter. He's, I don't know how you pronounce this, so I'll spell it out, but I'll try and pronounce it first. He's at, at Ecorsi Filmmaker. E C O S S E F I L M E M double M A K E R. Um, he's known as Fraser. He does something called Cops and Monsters every single week without fail. He retweets the tweet um, for the the show um, to his followers. He's got m- near more than a thousand followers, and he retweets it um, every single week. And I appreciate it every single time he does it. Believe it or not, I actually met one of the people who worked on the crew with him. I actually, because I was working on a film crew the other day, and she was talking about that, and I met them. Yeah, so please do see Go Cops and Monsters. Follow them on Twitter as well, but also follow him, because every single week without fail, he retweets the short tweet, and I, I appreciate I've spoke to him once. It'd be nice to actually speak to him again, but I appreciate that every single week. Yeah, thanks for that very much. Um, also, I just forgot to mention... Following the nerd.com, who are friends of ours, and despite Mark there and I are having fallouts almost every sort of week regarding Marvel and DC. Um, and the fact and that he thinks that Star Wars is the second coming of Christ, even though he is completely and <laughs> utterly wrong. Um, and I'm and not going also, to be allowed back on the show ever again. You're not. Um, and also, then Stuart from page2screen.com, which is the number two instead of TO. Kind of like Dumber and Dumber 2, but the right way around. Less intelligent. Uh, Oh, <laughs> you're not going to be allowed back on anyone's show at this rate. Oh, brilliant. Not even on this one, neither. Yeah. I um, think there's only going to be one film in the cinema section possibly next week. I could be two. wrong, but is it two? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, one of which is a very, very big film um, there. But the other one, is it, is it next week the other one is out, this one we're playing a clip for? No, that's out the week after. The week after. Okay. Um, but we'll play that with a clip from a film that's coming out the week after Avengers Age of Ultron, which comes out this week. Uh, the week after that is a film called Unfriended, which is a uh, sort of a cyber horror film. Based on uh, Skype. Yeah. Um, so uh, we'll see you back again next Monday night, hopefully, at the usual time. Closer to the usual time, hopefully, if I manage to make things and everything works out. Not likely. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. Uh, I'm not making friends tonight anyway, so I no, might no. as well just ham- hammer the last nail in my coffin, so... Um, yeah, so before I forget, movie of the week. Very easily to forget, considering that there is very little out that I can classify as movie of the week quality. Not even Lord, of the, uh, not even Hobbit, Battle of the Five Armies. I just see it, don't watch any of that stuff, watch the impossible. <laughs> um, this Hot week, mate. this week, I kind of have to agree. I mean, yeah, just watch the impossible on Sunday night. Yeah. Uh, Watch it with TV on... movies of the week. Killer Joe and Impossible. Yeah, nine nine p.m. Channel Four. T- uh, yeah, nine p.m. Channel Four. Sunday the twenty sixth. That's yeah. our that's our t- that's our TV movie and movie of the week. So yeah. uh, we'll see you next week with a review. As I say, amongst other things, Age of Ultron. But um, we'll leave you with a clip for the un- the movie Unfriended, which comes out the week after. Until next week. Good night. Adios. <laughs> Where are you coming from, man? Hey, Mitch, why 
why you're now. such a big boner, bro. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? I totally missed it. Shut up. Hey, Blair. Hey, Not funny. Blair, you're, How are you? Your blouse, babe. What? What are you calling my girlfriend babe for? Hey, Mitch, who's your buddy? Get off. What? Who's your buddy? Cyber uh, 3 uh, That's not with that.